Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hi, and welcome to the Open Gov Hub. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Netta, and I'm the director here at the Open Gov Hub. Um, I always like to find out if uh, this is anyone's first time joining us. If you raise your hand. Okay. Uh, in the back, I don't think that's true. <laughs> um, well, welcome. Um, so just to give you a quick introduction, uh, the Open Gov Hub was established uh, in late 2012. And we were set up as the first co-working community to focus on this theme of open government and open governance. Um, and we've always defined that theme as having three pillars. Um, so we have a community of people who are really trying to promote transparency, accountability, and civic participation all around the world. Um, and the hub itself exists to enable and support this community of open government advocates. Um, and we do that through helping our member organizations share resources with each other. Um, so we have this large shared office space, um, but also really through collaboration and community. Um, and we've always hosted a huge variety of regular events um, to convene different stakeholders together around shared interests and challenges um, to really help this community as a whole have greater impact. Um, so we currently have 40 member organizations um, and over 200 people who are part of our community. Um, and we're especially excited for our special event today um, to really look at some really cutting edge research um, that can help inform the work that so many groups uh, here and beyond are doing around government and development. Um, so if you have any questions about the Hub, please feel free to grab me or um, some of our members who are here with us today. Uh, but with that, I'll hand it over to Alan Hudson, um, who's the Executive Director of Global Integrity and is moderating our event today. So, thank you. Thank you, Nada. Um, nice to see you all here. Thank you for coming. Um, just a, a couple of words of introduction from me. So, as Nada said, I'm the um, person who left bottles <laughs> fall off tables. Uh, I'm also the uh, executive director of Global Integrity. Uh, we are in the business of um, supporting progress to, towards more open, accountable, and most importantly, uh, effective governance uh, in countries and communities uh, around the world. And uh, what we try to do is we try to shape uh, thinking, policy, and practice on the governance and development agenda so that locally led innovation, learning, and adaptation is uh, center stage. Um, so we're super excited, I'm super excited, I have been for a number of weeks uh, about this, uh, about today's event, uh, um, and to hear from uh, Gwen Yuan Ang from the University of Michigan um, uh, about her groundbreaking work on China. The kind of concrete question that Yuan addresses in that book um, is, is um, and this is a quote from Lance Richard, um, how did China escape from long-term stagnation and political chaos into the fastest and longest and most poverty-reducing burst of economic growth in the history of humankind? So a pretty big question, uh, a rather important one for those of us concerned with development uh, and, and governance. Um, I'm particularly excited about, about today's event for, for three reasons. Firstly, an opportunity to, to uh, uh, hear about China's development and, and to better understand China's development. I remember at the launch of the Open Gulf Hub three years ago, three and a half years ago. Who was here for the launch of the Open Gulf Hub three years ago? Anyone? A few? Um, former President of the World Bank, James Wolfenstein, was here, and he made the point that the governance and development agenda needs to pay more attention to China and Asia. Um, I'm glad that that is beginning to happen. Um, it's uh, it's it's uh, high time that was the case. Um, secondly, I'm excited because Yuan's work provides a, what I think is a, 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 an outstanding and constructive challenge to the good governance agenda. So I think that's awesome. And then also the way in which uh, she analyzes uh, change uh, in complex systems and looks at the importance of learning and adaptation uh, for change in complex systems. It's, it's super exciting. Um, so we're going to move ahead. Um, Yuan went first with a, a, a brief presentation about her book on how China escaped the poverty trap. Then uh, some uh, comments, reflections from uh, Shanti Kalafil um, from the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, who uh, has very, very kindly and graciously stepped in at the last minute uh, in place of Mary Beth Goodman, who is unwell at the moment. Uh, so Shanti, uh, thank you very much for that. And then some reflections from Eduardo Aldada um, from the World Bank. Uh, one of the lead authors of the groundbreaking uh, World Development Report 2017, um, so, uh, and has been very involved in uh, governance assessments uh, and thinking about uh, governance data and, and 
how governance data can be uh, useful and actionable. So uh, very, much look, very much looking forward to reflections from uh, to discussants. And then we should have uh, plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion, comments uh, from the floor uh, before then returning to the, uh, to the two main discussants from Glenn um, to finish off. Um, there are refreshments as you can see outside. It is not good to sneak out very briefly and quietly midway through to get a bit of cheese or a bit of fruit, so feel free. Uh, um, um, and with that, I think we will kick off. So, thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much to Alan, Nada, colleagues at Global Integrity for having me here today. Um, you can probably guess that this is my first time at um, the Open Gov Hub because I'm wearing black, the establishment color. And as soon as I stepped past the glass doors, I felt the innovative, adaptive hype, you know, vibes of this place, and I thought I should just wear my West Coast clothing. So, despite the colors, I hope that you see that uh, my work is in line with the innovative, adaptive culture at uh, Open Gut Hub. So um, I have only 20 minutes, and I won't be able to talk about you know everything about my research. But I'd like to share with you a flavor of how I go about answering this big, important question, which is how can developing countries in general escape the vicious cycle of poverty and weak bad institutions? What are the lessons that we can learn from China? So this is a book, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap. And this title reflects a broader problem that we face in the developing world. This problem is called the poverty trap. What is the poverty trap? The basic idea is that when we go to poor countries, the problem that they face is not only that they're economically poor, but also because they face a variety of what we might call weak, bad, wrong institutions, right? Corruption, uh, patronage, lack of rule of law, lack of technocratic bureaucracy, lack of meritocracy, lack of property rights, and so forth. So I use the label weak, wrong, backward institutions as a catch-all phrase for all of these um, bad institutions. So poor countries are poor because they have weak institutions, and they have weak institutions because they are poor. And this problem is what I call the poverty trap. Okay? So how can we get out of the poverty trap? The conventional wisdom from the good governance paradigm believes that you know, it's very hard to fix the economy. It's hard to make poor countries rich in a short time. So maybe we could start by fixing the institutions. So the conventional wisdom tells us that we should first establish good, strong institutions, eradicate corruption, you know, institute rule of law, institute meritocratic bureaucracies, and so forth. And if you get institutions right, then eventually you will have economic success. The problem with the conventional wisdom is the but. But in practice, and I'm sure this group knows well, it is very hard to establish and consolidate good, strong institutions in poor countries. And here I quote from my two favorite authors in global development, Lam Pritchard and Michael Woolcock. Um, in fact, they believe that not only is it difficult to establish good, strong institutions, imposing best practices of good governance has been, according to them, a root cause of the deep problems encountered by developing countries. There are numerous examples that I need not repeat, but the basic idea is we go into poor countries, we have a checklist of good institutions that they should achieve. And because they want to get aid or they want to look good, they try to conform with these best practices, but they are unable to actualize them and they fail. And then everyone feels more despondent. So this leads to a sense of cynicism and a capability trap. So I love the title of this article by Lan Pritchard and Michael Wolcott. They call it when the solution is the problem. And I think it's a brilliant synthesis of the problem with the good governance paradigm, that we thought good governance is supposed to be the solution to the problem of poverty. 
but decades of trying to establish good governance, we find that achieving good governance has become the problem, right? So this is what we know at this point. We know that poor countries are stuck. They're poor, they have the weak institutions. What we don't know is how can they become unstuck, right? So in fact, one of the uh, best-selling books in development is called Why Nations Fail. So we know a lot about why nations fail, but we don't know very much about why some nations succeed despite lacking the ideal preconditions, right? despite defined policy prescriptions, despite the odds. So that's what we need to know. And so this is what my book hopes to provide is to extract some unconventional lessons from China's experience. So if you look at how China did its development and how it escaped the poverty trap, this can be summed up in one sort of short phrase. The unconventional solution in China is that they harness weak, wrong, backward institutions to build markets. So the basic idea is that all of those attributes and features, practices and norms that we would normally think of as problems or obstacles, they took these very same attributes, repackaged them, repurposed them, and actually made them into stepping stones toward development. And at the end of the talk, I'm gonna show you that China is the best example of this strategy but it is in fact not unique to China. You can find numerous examples of this strategy throughout Western history and in pockets of the developing world. Okay. But first, let me tell you the China story. Okay, so this is the um, cover image on my book. And I'm very lucky to work with Cornell University Press. The editor was very patient with me. When we were selecting the book cover, I insisted we're not gonna have tigers or dragons, <laughs> or another picture of Shanghai Ban. I picked this picture, and you can see that it's a group of children standing on a hilltop. Um, and I would like you to sort of make a guess. Where do you think this picture, which part of China is this picture taken? Where in China do you think is this picture taken? Within, very good guess. Anyone else? Anyone else? Sorry? Longzhou, why did you guess Longzhou? The shape of the mountains. Well, you know a lot about geography. All right. Guilin, Guangzhou, anyone else? Shanti, can you guess? Okay. You're going to guess Guangzhou okay, but by the shape of the mountains as well? Okay. Yeah, okay. So most people looking at this picture would guess Guilin, would guess Sichuan, would guess you know, Guizhou, which are the poor western parts of China. But you two are very exceptional. You actually made the right guess. This is Guangdong province in 1982. All right, so I picked this picture because I wanted to remind readers that only a generation ago, Guangdong province, if you go to Guangdong province, it looks not, nothing like this. But only a generation ago, China was in fact a very poor country. This is a group of children standing on a hilltop and they were looking at a highway that was just being built at the time. So before I go into the details of the China story, it's helpful to review a few basic facts about China. Okay? The first fact is that prior to market reform, China was a very poor country. So this is a common misconception because we hear so much about the rise of China. A lot of people think that China probably was never a poor country, and that is not true. In fact, in 1980, in terms of income per capita, China was poorer than Malawi, Bangladesh and Chad. Calorie consumption in China in the 1970s was lower than in the 1940s during the period of civil war. Right? So China started out as a very poor country. The second fact is that reforms began under an authoritarian but devastated untechnocratic bureaucracy. So this is a second misconception, very common, but people think, oh, because today China has a really strong, impressive authoritarian government. They must have had that government in the beginning. And because it was strong, it's no surprise that China would succeed. But in fact, when they first started reforms, 
This bureaucracy has been, has been especially devastated by the Cultural Revolution, which was a 10-year-long campaign of political persecution directed at bureaucrats. Mao himself called it utter chaos and all-out civil war. And in addition, unlike Hong Kong and Singapore, China did not inherit a professional civil service from British colonial rule. Right? So when China started out in 1970s, especially if you go to the township and village levels, the bureaucrats, the cadres, were basically poorly educated, poor, poor peasants from that very same village. Um, An early study shows that in the 1970s, the average years of schooling of China's government officials was 6.5 years. So contrary to popular impression, this is not a technocratic bureaucracy. Fact number three, um, it is well known that China had lifted 800 million people out of poverty. What is peculiar is that they did this in the first 30 to 35 years without anti-poverty policies in place. So today when you read the newspaper, you'll see that President Xi Jinping has a big anti-poverty campaign to eradicate the last 10% of absolute poverty in China. And that campaign is a micro level campaign targeted at individuals and families. But this is a new phenomenon in China. The bulk of poverty eradication in China was done during the first 35 years without any of these micro policies. And it was done through local development and local institutional innovation. So that's what we want to find out, right? Fact number four, unlike Singapore, China is big. So the province of Shandong in the north has as many people as the entire population of the United Kingdom. Okay, so we have to understand that China is more like a continent than it is a country. So if we want to understand the development in China, it is necessary to disaggregate the country. So what I do in my research is I analyze development both at the national level as well as the subnational level. So I go to different places in China, on the coast, as well as in the inland, and I trace their entire historical trajectory from 1980 to 2014, with the aim of understanding what was each step of the development process. And in particular, how did they start development when their conditions, when their starting conditions were so poor? So because of time constraints, I'm only going to sort of tell you the story of uh, places on the coastal part of China. So this is the part of China that opened market first and developed first. So um, the central government in 1978, you know, made this grand decision that they were going to have reform and opening. So following this national decision, what happened at the local levels? In the 1980s and 1990s, on the, um, among local governments on the coast, was it the case that they started development by first eradicating corruption, establishing private property rights, having transparency, and hiring technocrats? And the answer is no. They did none of these things on the list. Instead, this is what really happened. In the 1980s and 1990s, as soon as they had the green light from the central government to open markets, develop the economy, and attract investors, these local governments throughout the coast enlisted all the civil servants in the local government to recruit investors using their personal relations. So it doesn't matter if you're in the tax bureau, the economic bureau, the health bureau, the Handicap Association, if you are a public servant, there are about 20,000 of them in each city, you will be enlisted in the mass task of recruiting investors. And you will do that by using your friends and relatives, calling them, urging them to come and invest. And in addition, each civil servant could take a cut of the investments made. So this is like a sales commission, basically a profit sharing system. And thirdly, the local governments would set concrete targets for each department of the amount of investments that you should bring in, and this is paired with clear rewards and penalties. So if you look at what they actually did in the first step of development, 
you'll see that none of the things that they did is consistent with best practices. In fact, it is outright unacceptable by our norms, right? Um, so why did they do sort of what is wrong? And the reason for that is you have to imagine that in the 1980s, they were starting out with a bureaucracy that is not technocratic. It is filled with people who are not professionals and you cannot fire any one of them. This is a very common problem that you see in developing countries, right? But instead of trying to eradicate what already exists, these local governments very cleverly decided that they were going to turn it into a resource. And the best resource they have is the personal connections of the civil servants. But they have to mobilize them to use those connections to the collective benefit by giving them the right incentives. So all of these practices, even though they're not consistent with good governance, actually fitted very well with the particular conditions, the resources, and the constraints of early development. So if you look at this particular moment in time, the one lesson we can draw is that normatively weak or wrong institutions can be functionally strong. Another insight that one might draw from this particular snapshot of China's history is that, in fact, this is a very inclusive system, right? In development, we like to emphasize inclusiveness, and we tend to think of inclusiveness as something that we do for civil society. In an authoritarian system like China, the civil society is the bureaucracy. So that's kind of a strange concept, but because in fact, the autocracy is not just one leader, the bureaucracy itself is made up of 50 million actors, and they form a limited kind of civil society within China, where you can have a lot of participation, a lot of deliberation and innovation. So this system that they created, though unconventional, was in fact an inclusive system for all civil servants with personal resources to come and participate in this development process. But this initial strategy was not something that stayed there forever, because by the time the cities entered into the 2000s, the initial strategies that they used had worked, had helped to kick off the economy, had helped to attract investors, the fact that the economy takes off then creates new conditions, changes the environment, which then feeds back to the institutions. So when these economies transition from very poor, very rural, to sort of um, early industrial takeoff, what this does is that, first of all, it alters the resources of local governments. So before that, they might have no knowledge whatsoever of how to run a market economy. They had no contacts with uh, foreign investors. But as you get richer, you have more resources at your disposal. The second thing it does as you get richer is that your preferences for development change. So when these cities were very poor, they didn't care at all about the quality of investments. They just want to bring in any factory. It doesn't matter what you produce. So when that is your goal, it makes sense to ask everyone to participate in this process of bringing in investments. But as you get richer, your preferences change and you start to think, I don't want just any factory, right? I want factories in good sectors, in high tech sectors, high value add sectors. And when your preferences change, what you realize is that, well, I need a specialized bureaucracy now. So the preferences of development actually changes over the course of income accumulation. So if you look at these coastal cities today, you find a very different situation. They have bureaucracies that are much more formalized and professionalized. The earlier strategies that they have used, they have now completely abandoned. And this professionalized bureaucracy, which is more consistent with best practices, with good governance, serves to preserve an established market. But the strategies that created a new market in the first place were a completely different type of strategy. So this story that I tell is very specific to China. It has a lot of China content. And as a social scientist and for you know, the sake of, of development professionals who are trying to think on a more abstract level, we want to ask, 
if I took out all of these context specific details, now what is the thing that I can generalize from this experience? And what we can generalize is this three step sequence of development. So instead of thinking about development as either good governance leads to growth or growth leads to good governance, we should instead understand development as a three step interactive process. The first step of this process is to harness pre existing weak, wrong, backward institutions to build markets. The second step is when step one works and you have an emerging market, the emergence of markets itself will create the incentives and the resources to create strong institutions. And step three is that strong institutions serve to preserve markets. So once we have this very different three-step development sequence in mind, it would be, um, okay, this is just to give you an example of, are there cases beyond China where we see this sequence at work? This is an important uh, question. And the answer is yes. If you look across cases, you can find very similar sequences. The content is all different, but the sequence is the same. So in the last chapter of my book, I look at the rise of Nollywood in Nigeria. In Nigeria, they managed to create the world's third largest film industry without having any protection of intellectual property rights, which is really puzzling. And if you look at the historical development of this industry, what they had done is that the first step was that Nigerian filmmakers actually leverage piracy as a nimble distribution network and use that the problem, they turn the problem into a resource. So when I told Lan Pritchard this example of Nollywood, you know, I, I thought his comment was very uh, insightful. He said, that's right, they have a competitive advantage in lawlessness. And that is exactly, you know, the, the kind of insight that the things we normally think of as problems, obstacles, under certain circumstances, especially under circumstances of early development, those problems can actually be resources. Okay, great. And then if you look at Western history, you look at the evolution of property rights in late medieval Europe, you know, how did markets regional trade actually emerged in late medieval Europe. The first step of this process was actually to leverage upon communal property rights. Individual property rights is something that we see much, much later in the process of development. When they first started out, they used communes. And this is very similar to what China did in the 1980s. And then finally, an example from the US, if you look at the evolution of the public financial system in 19th century USA, and if you know anything about America's Gilded Age, that was the period of fastest growth in America, but that was plenty of corruption, right? And so how did they get to actually raise funds to build really big infrastructure projects like the Erie Canal? The US local governments leverage non-transparent, risky, taxless finance, which is very similar to what China is doing today. So you, there are many, many more examples I could go on, but basically my point is, if you pick any case of successful development and you trace it back to the origins, not the middle staff, not the late staff, but the origins, you'll find that they all have to start by harnessing weak, wrong, backward institutions to build markets. And the reason for this is very simple. You can only start with what you have, not with what you want. Okay. All right. So where does the conventional wisdom lie? I'm not saying that the conventional wisdom is flat out wrong. I'm not saying that good governance is completely wrong. What my work is doing instead is to help us situate where the conventional wisdom is. So we're all familiar with why nations fail, the idea that you need good institutions for economic success. What this theory tells us is a theory about development at its late stages. So when you are a middle or high income economy, when you already have markets, you do need rule of law. You do need formal property rights, or you do need technocratic bureaucracies. But what these institutions serve do is to preserve markets that have already been created. 
But the strategy of creating new markets when you don't have those ideal conditions is a completely different type of strategy. And just to iterate, you have to start with what you have instead of what you want. All right, so if we sort of are able to place the conventional wisdom in the sequence that I laid out for you, I think it's helpful to highlight sort of three fallacies of the conventional wisdom, which sort of points us towards changes that we should make either in our concepts or in the practical work that we do. The first fallacy is that a lot of the conventional wisdom is sometimes ahistorical. We forget that the simple fact that rich countries did not start their development by using institutions that they now have. Right? So if you actually take history seriously and you look at the historical work, or you even look like um, Harun Chang has written a book about kicking away the ladder, who makes, that makes a very similar point. If you take history seriously and you look at their first steps, it's not true that they built markets by using the institutions that now exist. The second fallacy is that we conflate different stages of development and we incorrectly assume that preserving markets is the same as building markets. So logic is we look around our society, we look around the US, and we see that these are the good institutions that are correlated with economic wealth. So we assume that this must be the same institutions that we need to create new markets. But in fact, the tasks, the challenges of creating markets and preserving markets are completely different. Therefore, the institutions and the strategies that fit this different task must also be qualitatively different institutions. Okay. Two minutes, great. And then the final policy to point out, I think, um, and I want to emphasize that, is that a lot of the conventional wisdom judges the goodness of institutions by only one benchmark, that of the rich. Right? So when we go into developing countries, the developing communities, when you have only one benchmark and you think that Denmark is the ideal, is 10 over 10, and you go to any developing country, all you can see is problems. Right? All you can see is that they do not have what Denmark has but you are unable to describe what is it that they have, right? And because of that, we blind ourselves the development potential of institutions that already exist in poor countries. Great. So last slide, I have one more minute. Policy and research implications for open government. I'll just gonna highlight and iterate three points. The first is that I had this wonderful illuminating conversation with Alan. We talked about what do we need for better open governance, which everyone here is working for. And I think the first condition of open governance is that we need to be open-minded ourselves. Right? Very often when we work in development, we feel that the problem lies with the poor communities. The poor needs to change. But in fact, oftentimes, since we are the external actors, we need to change first. And we need to challenge some of these normative biases and assumptions that we have which ultimately would impact these societies. The second point I'd like to make is that we need to do more research on how markets emerge in the absence of, rather than through good governance and state capacity. Of course, in an ideal world, right, if we could go to developing countries and make them have good governance, you know, in a very short time, our problems would be solved. But we know that the reality is that that is very hard and it's not going to happen. So what we really need to understand instead is how can you create markets despite the lack of the ideal conditions that we are wishing for? And the third point I'd like to make is that we can make a lot of improvements by developing multiple benchmarks of good governance. So in the realm of good governance, we know there are a lot of measures and indices being made. The standard way of doing these indices is that we use one benchmark, the standards of capitalist democracies. Denmark is a 10 over 10, right? and every country is being evaluated by its distance from Denmark. This particular practice, which is very common, really limits our ability to learn 
and to adapt. And let me give you a simple analogy. To do this, to evaluate all countries in the world by their distance from Denmark is like evaluating individual by how male you are, right? So it's like, you know, if you're male, that's perfect. That's one of one. And if you're not male, I'm sorry, I don't have a name for you. I have to call you non-male, right? And then because you are non-male, my logic is you can't do what males do because you are non-male, right? And so the way we measure things, the way we think about what's perfect, what's a benchmark, you know, what's the right way to exist, actually really shapes the way we see the world and the way we are able to use resources and people that exist. So I'd like to make a case here that we can have so much room for improvement, so much room for adaptation, if we can think about some of these items that I placed on this slide. So on that note, I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to learning from your reactions. Uh, wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on straight away to uh, 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 some questions from Shanti. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions and uh, comments from the audience. Um, firstly, Shanti, uh, and then everyone. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to respond to this. As Alan mentioned, I am here filling again in the last moment for Mary Beth Goodman, who I originally came here along with Dan. Um, and so I thought I would open with a quote from Donald Rumsfeld appropriate to go to war with the army that you have, not the one that you want. So I'm the army that you have today. <laughs> Appropriately enough, that does comport with the theme of Yunyun's talk, which is in the field of development, essentially, as I understand it, for arguing, go to war with the army that you have. And often in development, not have the ideal army. The army is lacking banks and uh, boots often, and, and basic fundamentals that you might need to wage a good war. So I found many aspects of, you know, I, I didn't have time to read your whole book. <laughs> unfortunately, but I did sort of go through your presentation. And I tried to, you know, look through. I had written several blog posts, and I found several aspects of it compelling, um, especially in talking about how to uh, apply the mainstream development approaches, particularly with respect to complex development or rigidly when modes of development, thinking that first you do this and then you get this. Or, for instance, these rigid theories of change that we build for ourselves that then <coughs> trap us in a bit of a, a box. You know, we believe that these virtuous feedback cycles, um, virtuous feedback loops exist. Um, what happens when they don't? Uh, how do we account for all these imperfections? So, well, I think it's useful to have a framework to think about this issue. Um, I also think it's incredibly important to have. What I know Alan would champion as an adaptive learning approach, right, to good governance. Um, and in fact, I think you'll see um, a lot of that type of more nuanced approach reflected in the latest World Bank uh, WPR. You know, bank, you do have to have a more adaptive approach to development. It's really paramount in that part of the vice writing, I thought. Um, so essentially, you know, how do our desires for what should happen get there? Um, but before I go further, I should probably know I should do two things. First, these I'm just speaking in my personal capacity here. I might do not reflect my um, But that said, obviously, as I am at the National Endowment for Democracy, you might think that I do actually believe in democratic governance. And so, in fact, I do. And so I come at the issue um, from a distinct premise, which is I believe that democratic governance is intrinsically good. I believe that people should have basic rights, and in fact that basic rights that underpin good governance, they do so for a reason, because without them, you cannot meaningfully achieve the, the golden holy grail of transparency and accountability. So that's my own standpoint and how I approach it. And, you know, there's obviously debate within the development community about whether you should approach governance as something just fundamentally 
done to achieve other aims, such as efficient service delivery. We have efficient service delivery. I'm well aware of that strand, but for me, I do consider it to be, um, it is important and interesting to consider, but it's not necessarily where I come from. So, you know, where I come from, there are certain rights that we've agreed on, you can the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the ICPR, there are many things that many countries have agreed on and there build some framework for why we think that governance is important, not simply as a means to an end, but an end. Um, and so for that reason, in the development discourse, and um, I am not addressing this specifically to this presentation or to your research, but I think very broadly, the, the conception of growth and markets underpin the development discourse, and that's because the development uh, field has been around, it's been powered by economy. You know, and obviously, you're the World Bank or you've worked, you know, in any IFI, you know that economists drive the show at all of these traditionally have. And it's only recently that we've begun to see the ascendance of a more inclusive approach to development that also incorporates some of these other issues, such as governance, public governance, and currency economy. But because of where I come from, they don't solely see governance as something which is instrumental to. Measuring everything by that metric of growth in mar markets or using growth in markets as the dominant metric by which to judge the success of development or not, I feel like we have to wrap in some of these other perspectives or at least this other perspective about um, what else are we accomplishing or not accomplishing aside from growth. Because the word growth can often conceal a multitude of sins. And I'm a former financial reporter, you know, I used to write about markets all the time. Um, but there's a lot that happens in odd economic measures which are not captured. Um, and particularly in the case of China, I think, you know, the country has made amazing strides in lifting people out of poverty. So if your view of development is that that is the main goal of development and that good or open governance exists as a means to that end, then that would lead you to one particular perspective. Um, Looking broadly at growth in China, though, um, we have to also consider the ways in which other aspects of growth have been not quite as savory, such as growth quality, for instance, which I'm sure you're familiar with. But um, you know, it has been striking. And China is now one of the more uh, unequal countries in the world, um, despite the growth of its middle class. Um, and I, I would also turn to, I guess, you know, this is connected to the idea of using imperfect execution, weird, bad words, whatever your terms are, right? Um, and the idea that, you know, you have to be realistic that sometimes in developing countries, institutions are corrupt, and maybe you need to do the best with them that you can to get to another phase whereby you can strengthen those institutions. And in China, I think. That the jury is out as to whether that's really happening. And certainly you can talk to a number of China experts and argue one way or another. Um, I have found uh, Minxin Pei's work on this fairly convincing. He's obviously quite a strong critic of what he sees as endemic corruption in China. So I guess I would question whether if you work with imperfect or corrupt institutions to begin with in China or in other places, to what extent does that entrench those those practices and make them even harder to combat as you sort of move along this development pathway to greater wealth and greater growth? Um, obviously, in China, I think corruption is a huge problem, but it's so huge, in fact, that Xi Jinping mentioned had to actively try to control it and made it a signature rule, actually. Um, and again, I think sort of Talking about the talking about corruption as sort of a necessary evil or something that can get you to something else, downplay the really devastating effects that corruption can have on everyday Chinese citizens or indeed citizens of developing countries around the world. And I know, no doubt, everybody in this world has traveled. Everybody in this room has traveled places around the world where those people will tell you whether they're in big cities or in small villages, the uh, impact that corruption has on their lives. And, and that gets me back again to sort of what are we striving for here? So 
do we agree that we are trying, even if we can't have good governance, say we accept that we can't um, impose these conditions, not right to sort of start with them. Um, but do we still all agree that that's where we want to move, that we want to move towards better governance, we towards more open governance? Um, because if so, I think that also leads you in certain directions with respect to how we understand the problem, what the trade offs are. Um, so, I'll, I know Alan is giving me the, the wrap up side. So, I mean, I, I thought this was my final thoughts on, you know, the policy prescriptions. I think you're right. I think we have to be more open minded in how we approach development. Um, I think sort of thinking of it solely from the let's look around and just do do whatever we're seeing in a developed country approach is, you know, I think many of us would agree that's not a sensible way to approach development. Um, and again, I think you know, the WDR made a couple of key points about, um, you know, don't think just about the right form of institutions, but about the function of institutions. Don't just build capacity, think about power asymmetries. Um, think about not just rule of law, but the whole of law in many places. I think these are all getting to some of this approach. Um, and, you know, the idea about using multiple benchmarks, I think it's also sensible that, you know, we have to think about different ways to capture how countries are changing. Um, but that said, I do think sometimes it's useful to have, um, to have some standard benchmarks that all countries are measured against. And I would point out that I think if you were to look at the ratings for the U.S. and other developed democracies um, next year, you would see quite a, um, a change in the relative rankings of those countries on governance. And I think that shows the value of perhaps holding all countries to what may be unrealistic standards, but still showcase that this is what we would all consider to be an ideal state, so we can understand how all countries um, and then finally, just to put these in a broader context, I think, um, you know, that highlights the fact that we are undergoing a very difficult period right now. I think that we typically, we tend to view development issues sometimes with the prism of a single country or within a vacuum, and, and they're not. I think all these things are happening in a period where um, democracy is under attack. It's in decline and under attack. And um, at the same time, uh, kleptocracy is on the rise, grand corruption is on the rise, intractable problems, um, populism, and um, sort of an erosion of democratic norms around the world. And so I think I would challenge all of us who sit at this intersection of democracy, governance, development, to, to think about how all these things matter in this broader context what extent the way that we approach these problems uh, has an impact or doesn't have an impact on some of these larger and very important issues. Thank you very much, Shanti. Uh, turning now to Edward. Thank you for having me. Sorry for wearing a tie. I hope you accept that what's inside is less conventional. <laughs> sorry for being naive too. <laughs> uh, anyway, wow, wow. If only we had come across uh, you know, the book you had started to write when we started writing. Um, so, uh, hats off. I'm, Endorse very much everything that that you have been uh, that you have been talking about. Um, let me then let me do two things: take a world comparative perspective on this first, and second, look at some of what characterizes institutions that we call uh, normatively uh, uh, weak and function uh, strong. So uh, we started our query uh, from outcomes, the outcomes that we felt as World Bank matters most for us, so growth, equity, security, and then we looked back. Uh, to do so, we looked at 13 countries that the Growth Commission had found had grown the most 7% every year over 25 years, so growth. We looked at the countries that had used inequality the most over the past 
two decades, and we looked at the countries that had these, the lowest rates of homicides and the lowest rates of deaths from conflict combined. What do we find? We find countries from all types of political regimes and all sorts of governance. You find monarchies, democracies, federalist systems, centralized systems. You find the three Chinas, China, China, Taiwan, China, and Hong Kong, China, in the 13 countries. So what explains this heterogeneity in these different pathways amidst the conflict of, against the homogeneity of these three outcomes, growth, security, and equity. We find out that what characterizes these three, uh, uh, these, these, uh, these, all these countries, regardless of the type of regime they have, regardless of the form of the institution that they have, regardless of their governance, the form that the, the, the trappings of their governance, was that they actually, their institutions were fulfilling a certain number of important functions, which we then a little bit deep into. And adopting a game theory framework, but also looking a lot at history, we find out that they have a certain, these functions have a certain number of points in common. Three, one, main. Two others. First, their, they, the institutions were characterized by credible commitment. So basically, governments saying something and delivering on it. All right? Second, they were characterized by cooperation between citizens and governments. What, what we call, you know, it, but call it quasi voluntary cooperation. And third, by social coordination between these different actors. These are game theoretic terms. The first one in, in jargon, uh, in game theory, commitment is an answer to the time inconsistency problem, basically. Someone promises something, then gets to power, gets incentives, and other incentives and changes their mind. Um, cooperation is the answer to the free rider uh, problem. So basically, some produce resources, but don't participate, I mean, part, consume resources, but don't participate in the process of their, their um, uh, production, they free ride. Coordination as the answer to the social incompatibility of incentive. So a lot of people want the same thing, but the aggregation of that same thing is, produces different outcomes. And so, uh, more concretely, um, we what we observe what we observe is not these game theoretic, very technical terms in those countries and those and those institutions. What we observe is that commitment means enforcement. So basically a government that passes a law, whatever the quality of it, but enforces it. Not just passes a super great law that they cannot enforce because of different norms or different incentives or what have you. It also is about the protection, however imperfect, of property rights. It's also about the territory, ensuring the territorial reach of the state, delivering services. Cooperation is about trust in government. It's about compliance with government, measured by whether people pay taxes or not, whether they stop at red light or not, whether they comply with government rules and regulations. And coordination is illustrated by leadership, leadership acting as a focal point to get everybody moving and looking in the same direction, and by social cohesion between the, uh, the, the different parts of, um, of society. We find out that institutions characterized by the three core functions were much more effective at achieving growth, security, and equity in the long term than, than institutions that look like nice institutions but that do not walk like I Okay, so now in doing so, in, uh, we got a lot of our examples from, from history. The rise of the first states and the first markets in Mesopotamia. These were not states where the government, the king, uh, the, the, the king priest or whatever he was, um, was saying, oh, let me guarantee your property rights and that trade you know, keep going. These were just countries that were using their strategic 
existence along the river and where the king was also the main guy capturing trade. But we also looked at uh, the first institutions that arose in you know, ancient Mesopotamia and ancient governments were not producing, uh, providing health and uh, education services or respecting human rights. They were doing only two things, taxation and conscription. And these are the origins of government. I count my populations to know how many, how, ma how many I can tax, and the more I can tax, the better. Hence the origin of accounting. And I count how many able males I have to basically force them into conscription and go make more wars to enrich myself. And hence the first civil service. So we also look at the rise of accountability institutions in, uh, in Western Europe. Not just the Magna Carta, but the first rights that feudals in feudalist in France gave to uh, gave to their citizens. How the right of vote was extended to women as a result of and uh, and and uh, not just the elites as a result of social movements in 19th century Germany. We look at Fernand uh, Baudel. We look at uh, at Georges Duby and the uh, historians of medieval Europe. We look at Duby, who basically copied them um, uh, and. We um, also look at the work of Don Wallace on, um, on you know, uh, the rise of um, uh, financial uh, financial services in uh, in the Gilded Age in, in the States, and we find out that it never started looking good. It actually started looking quite crappy. It start it the, the it started with corruption. It didn't start with ethics. So, and today, and then, as a rise, as the need to control corruption, to safeguard more gains from trade, from entrepreneurship arose, there started to be an anti-corruption approach and a second and third phase of the lab development. What we have right now is a medical treatment of corruption. Is that the system looks very nice and suddenly, it catches a bug, the corruption bug, which we have to get rid of, and it's anti-corruption, so that the system goes and work again. No, it started with corruption, and then it, the norms towards corruption shifted. So Robert Good was, was very cool in his time, feeling you know, and uh, it's only later on that there was some kind of stigma associated with, you know. Uh, going and robbing people of, uh, of the roads. The same for violence. In the beginning, there was violence. That's more commonly accepted. You have Steve Pinker's book. And then those who were creating violence to enrich themselves, to have fun, to uh, you know, get more access to resources, they let trade and markets prosper so that they and they ensure so that they get richer. And then um, at some point. Why would they want to get richer to make more wars and get even richer and get more power? And at some point, they thought that they needed to uh, finance these wars, so they had to go uh, let trade, you know, uh, in the hands of traders. And then they had to borrow money from those traders, so they gave them a bunch of rights. Then they expanded those rights a little bit more, as the tiers d'état in France. And uh, then you had. Uh, as a result of social pressure from the from the ones who were working on the factories and creating all these all this wealth, they had to extend the right of vote to first to men and then to women and then and and, and 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 so on. So the bottom line here is that over time, a change of incentives by those who have power, a change of preferences and ideas and norms by those by you know citizens and those who are in power, and the rise of a need to control mechanisms that started a little bit organically and haphazardly is what got development outcome, you know, in the long run. They have the, we have this funny thing that we call fragile state uh, at the world Bank. And to me, it's a bit, I mean, ahistorical because they try to learn these 37 or you know, however expanding number of fragile states try to learn from each other. And so they put them in the same group, and they say, well, learn from each other. To my mind, you need, first of all, all states started being fragile states. 
France was a fragile state in the 13th century and up to La France in the 17th century. England was a fragile state up to Cromwell. Uh, uh, Italy was a fragile state where conflicts were, you know, the first trade man, they were not saying, can I please have your piece of meat? So it, violence was the answer to, to, to solving these problems. And, the, and only later was security emerging to basically let trade and, and, and the proceeds of trade and the proceeds of finance. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm getting carried away, but the main point is that if you've watched Marco Polo, that, uh, the TV series, you will note that they would give immunity from uh, wars to traders going from one country to another. Why so? Because these traders were actually the lifeblood of the wars that these folks were doing. And so the first, the first privilege were, were given to merchants from outside those who have power. And then these privileges were expanded. If we are to follow the same approach, which is that, you know, it starts with a bureaucrat and then it's inclusive and then it's progressively, you know, uh, uh, these rights and governance is bestowed. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it, it bestowed as a, as, as a last resort, you know. Um, you, you get to a situation where incrementalism is the name of the game, and where it starts bad and then it gets fixed over time. And so when we look at countries today and we expect them to develop in 14, 15 years, you have to look at these countries that resolve the problem of violence, Switzerland, for example, they kept fighting before, before actually becoming the very and well-governed nation they are today. So the story is one of incrementalism, it's one of changing incentives over time, it's one of cost-benefit analysis, it's one of rising contestability, it's not one of here's one standard and let's all work in a shiny, uh, you know, hands in hands to, uh, to get. So thank you again. Uh, that was awesome. <laughs> Um, great, Edward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, thank you to Shanti and Yuen as well for uh, awesome, uh, really stimulating uh, presentations. I want to turn uh, directly to, to the audience for uh, questions and comments. Um, please uh, let me know if you want to jump in. Um, also, uh, can you start off by saying, uh, let us know who you are and what organisation you're working with. And let's try and keep, please, uh, comments and questions brief so we can give everybody a chance to get in. Um, uh, is this the microphone? Thank you. Uh, my name is Amparo Ejian. I work at the World Bank. I uh, help uh, client countries open data program. Uh, my question is about the tools that China use to implement this policy of turning all the civil servants into uh, uh, agents of uh, investment attraction. So one of the problems that often happens in developing countries is uh, you agree to a law, and Congress passes a law, and the moment that the law is passed, the problem disappears, and obviously it ain't like that. Um, so what, how did they implement this? Was there, was there a law? Was there an executive decree? Was there a memorandum to every civil service? Henceforth, you shall now do this. And, and how was implemented in practice the, the, the commission that they got when they got in, in this? But the, the devil is in the detail, I, and I want to know where it goes. So um, we will collect, we'll collect three or four questions and then give people a, a chance to uh, Okay, my name is Guy Afonuski with United States of Africa 2017 Project Task Force. Thank you very much for all the presentation and the offer also. Very interesting, when I was a lecturer in Africa about development and change, one example I gave you is this, and you did it very well in a different sense. Present an hammer that somebody is a hammer. What is it for? You tell everybody telling you it's gold. Hammer something here. I say, I'm very able to think about it as also a modern weapon. Okay, so that's what the weak institution, the Chinese Communist Party, did by transforming those weak institutions into doing something else to create 
capital and entrepreneurship. Second, how can you apply that China in Africa? It will not happen unless there's a political federation. Think about it. And you want one people think about it. You all are just what they say, like those 20 monkeys in the room. Never know, they keep on doing the same thing. You never know why it was set up originally. <laughs> Hi there, my name is um, Lakshmi Kumar, and I'm a graduate student from the Fletcher School. And um, I think my question is that the broader question of development talks about growing institutions at a lower level and a mid range level. So my question is that, and even at the higher end of development, you see that institutions seem to be failing in some ways, you know, like this rise of populism, the, the, you know, the failure of the climate accord for the U.S. pulling out. So our national and supranational institutions are failing, and yet we are pushing everyone towards those same types of institutions. So should the discussion on one hand focus on, like, these early stages of, you know, development institutions, but shouldn't there also be a rethinking and perhaps a harder look at the you know, higher level institution that we all seem to be moving towards. Also, just a quick point, I was going to say, also, well, I really like what Shanti said, you know, I'm from India, and we, we often say we want to emulate China, but the thing is, you know, development is not development without factoring the human element and all of it, so it's just like five more. Thank you. Let's take one more question um, in this round. Um, hi, uh, my name is Dia, I work in corporate intelligence, but I used to work with UN. Uh, uh, I think the speaker for a very fascinating um, introduction of research, uh, but really an um, um, interesting insight. Um, uh, and there's a rebuttal, obviously, of institutions. And, you know, uh, uh, Darren's book on why nations fail and how it's perhaps another, you know. A primary kind of um, way of thinking for us uh, in terms of uh, when it comes to international development. My question really is um, what do you think uh, of another paradigm of uh, international development? And that is the culturalists. You know, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Lawrence Harrison, who wrote the wonderful book, The Central Threat of Liberalism, where he really empirically demonstrates the rather Politically incorrect, you'd say, theory that culture is the number one factor that determines uh, development of nation or the lack thereof, um, and whether or not you think the incentives demonstrated uh, or implemented in China. Um, I mean, the primary incentive there was really the introduction of private property and privatization by Davy so King. Do you not think that the trajectory of Chinese development, you know, would be the same really if, you know, it was left at that, just privatization and the introduction of private property, right? Because, you know, you look at China or Asia broadly, really, I mean, the Han Chinese, the ethnic group, have succeeded economically everywhere. And on that one, we China, we mentioned here earlier, but look at the Chinese ethnic minority in the Philippines, one of the most you know, poor countries in Asia. I mean, the ethnic Chinese constitute only like 5% of the country's population, and yet they control an overwhelming majority of the country's economic resources. Um, there are other examples of other ethnic groups that have succeeded, you know, uh, rather than not. What is your response to the cultural thing? Thank you. Very good, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to in, invite Yuen, Shanti, and Edward to pick up on uh, whichever of those questions they would like to. Uh, I think Amaro's question gives you an opportunity to talk about direct improvisation and the role of meta institutions in China's development, maybe. I will leave uh, Shanti and Edward to decide whether they respond to questions about 20 monkeys uh, <laughs> or, or whatever. Or whatever. Could you well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very thoughtful questions. And so I'm trying to think of uh, how, how to address them short time I have. Right? Okay, so I, I think the first question is really great. I would need really another talk. 
<laughs> to address your question about what was, but the short answer is this, that the part that I couldn't talk about, I didn't have time enough to talk about, is that these local improvisations were able to happen because China built an adaptive environment in the past. So how it worked in China was that Beijing actually never told the local governments what they were supposed to do in detail. So nobody, this, this thing about recruiting civil servants to become to become salesmen, it was a bottom-up innovation. It was not even written down to, as a policy, it was a practice. And what Beijing basically did was, we give you the green light, and we'll decentralize it. You local government decide for yourself what is the best thing to do. But importantly, Beijing set parameters for experimentation. So the policy signals, instead of writing down in detail what you you know, or what you're supposed to do. They give detail, they give signals about these are certain red lines that you cannot cross. There are certain things you cannot do. So in the 1980s, you cannot have private property. They made that very clear. And then they have signals about these are the things that you definitely can do. And it gives local government an idea that, oh, there are certain big steps, bold steps. And then there's a third category of policies in China, which is deliberately ambiguous. And that ambiguity is something that these local officials use to give themselves political space to experiment. Because Beijing didn't say whether you can or cannot do this. So this is the sort of broader uh, themes of directed improvisation that Alex mentioned that enables this, this adaptation to happen in China. So that will be a second, the second part of my book. And then the, I think I would group these questions on sort of how, how do we learn from China? What should we learn from China? And I think my short answer to that is that it's very important to understand that what we should learn from China is how China learns. So oftentimes we go to China and we try to look for, we try to imitate something that China did, right? But that is not practical because you can't imitate the Chinese Communist Party, right? You can't make your bureaucrats, you know, uh, recruit investments on us because that was part of their authoritarian communism. So learning is not about copying particular things that this or that country has done. What we should learn from China instead is how did China adapt? How did China learn? How did they create the institutions to make their bureaucrats so adaptive? So those are the things that we should learn. And those are the things that we can apply to countries like India and Africa, which is discussed actually in the last chapter of my book. Then there were questions about culture. Yes, okay. Yes, culture is a popular argument. I don't buy cultural arguments because very simply, um, culture is something that is stable, right? We call something culture precisely because it's stable. So Chinese culture has been employed for three to 5,000 years. So if culture has always been there, then how could this variable explain huge successes and huge failures over time, right? There were periods in China where there was total stagnation. There were periods in China where there was great innovation. So how could the same you know, factor that has not changed explain variation in the outcome? So that's why I don't buy culture. The other thing about culture is that it is completely untrue that China has one culture, which we usually call Confucian. That's completely not true. Because you know, I've done field work throughout China. One of the things you notice is that China has many cultures within China. If you go to inland China, the bureaucrats would say, you know, we have, you know, we in inland China are not like the people in Zhejiang. We are very lazy. We are un un we're not entrepreneurial. We're very conservative. We don't like change. You know, and so China does not have one culture. So that's why I don't buy this culture argument. And the last point I'd like to make is very quickly in response to Shanti's good point about corruption, which is a big concern. As we, and yes, as we all know, China has a big problem with corruption. Xi Jinping is not trying to fight corruption. Pei Minxin's book makes a very attractive argument. Right? He says that China is extremely corrupt, you know, and the country is going to collapse because of corruption. But what Pei Minxin doesn't do is that he does not disaggregate corruption. So I'm now writing a second book, which I just told Alan about, on corruption in China. And we have collected some data. So I wish I brought my chart, but if I could show you my chart, what you will see over time in China is that embezzlement, misuse of public funds, and petty bribery have steadily declined in China. The type of corruption that has exploded in China is grand bribery, you know, grand exchanges between big companies and elite. So 
that is the kind of corruption that Xi Jinping is trying to fight. But the success of China is that in addition to the economic development, they have fought other types of corruption that directly affect the lives of Chinese. So there is a survey that shows that the, if you ask Chinese citizens, now how often did you have to pay a bribe in the previous 12 months? The percentage in China is 10%, which is about the same as Malaysia. In India, it's 50%. So you have a different structure of corruption in China. It's very important that we disaggregate this concept. I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> there's so many points and so many questions. Um, let me just try to have a very brief framing um, thought, which is, for me, I think that the context matters quite a bit, the, the context of what political regime we're talking about, what type of regime we're talking about. In China, it's an authoritarian regime, which does not accord its citizens basic rights. And so I think I can't disaggregate that from the findings here. Um, and it's also impossible to sort of prove the counterfactual. What if it wasn't like that? What would have happened? Um, in that sense, you know, we just kind of have to do um, what Union has advocated, just look at what the actual situation was and what we can learn from it. But, you know, for me, the bottom line is you, as you know, you pointed out, you, you have a very different situation in an India um, versus a China. In India, uh, which is an imperfect democracy, as all democracies are imperfect, but there, I think there are additional channels of accountability, participation, and transparency available to civil society broadly, not just within bureaucracies, but broadly to citizens that are not um, present in China. And for that reason, I think um, it, it's hard to draw these comparisons across these various regime types. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I think that may be because you know, I place these things in a particular context. I just believe that you can't extricate them from each other. You can't solely talk about growth without realizing um, the very real costs at which that growth may come to a country's people. And um, I think as long as you have that premise to understanding things, uh, it doesn't mean that you can't appreciate authoritarian innovation within bureaucracies, but it always has to be within that context. And that's a, that's a very real context that I think is sometimes absent in mainstream development discourse. I'll take the one on the, on the culturalist argument. Honestly, it's the biggest catch-all term. It means everything and nothing. I don't know, I mean, what, what, what to make of it. The bottom line is that it boils down to the incentives and behaviors of particular individuals and groups over time. And um, it's, you know, there's, um, it becomes prone to stereotypication and the, the, um, what, what you observe is, and what people tend to call culture is, is a certain way of behaving because of a certain, um, um, number of incentives that have been, you know, present over a certain period of time. And so they, you know, they became, they became, uh, iterative and, and, uh, and, and repetitive. Incentives change, culture changes. They used to say, oh, Muslim women, you know, they don't go to work, their husbands don't want them to go to work, etc. You find, in, the first thing you find in when, when people get in a certain situation, refugees, they lose income, they, uh, they, have to, they go into a certain, um, um, through a certain transformation, women start working. And so it's incentives that have, that have, uh, that have changed. Um, also, uh, the example, you know, of Chinese traders in the Philippines, etc. It has to do with fulfilling these functions that I was telling you about. One of those functions is social cohesion. And groups that have high social cohesion because, you know, they travel over long distances of time. And so the importance of a certain word, of a certain commitment uh, is important. They tend to, over time, you know, be, uh, develop these um, uh, kind of uh, uh, institutional features that 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 bind them. Um, the same for you know Lebanese in West Africa. The um, if 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 you if you read about you know Avner Greif's work on uh, 
the micro elite uh, Jewish traders or um, Sydney and Goy Stein's work on the same communities of, of Jewish traders of North Africa and Libya and Egypt in the 12th century, you see that as a result of the, some structural needs, long-term commerce, the need to uh, send promissory notes that will travel for thousands of kilometers and that will say, pay X person Y amount of money now, and I will pay you back later. That is commitment at work. That is social cohesion between groups based on trust. And this is what gets you the long-term development outcomes that we're talking about. Very good. So let's, um, let's take another um, a quick round of questions, please. Uh, Anders, and then first your uh, hey, I'm uh, I work for National Peace of Governance to work on uh, Brexit. Also, to Denmark. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I think so. Have a long term. I do think so. <laughs> and I, I very hard seeing sort of the commercial improvement of bicycle links in PC. It's very difficult to get to that. But, um, but anyway, a fantastic discussion. Also, really great intervention from all of you. Um, I was curious about the examples of like, I guess two questions. You, you mentioned Hollywood as an example. We also see a lot of structures and innovation happen around what you could potentially call product activity. So in Nigeria, for example, we have a oil sector that's incredibly creative. We have pipelines where the oil is put for one way, actually it goes the other way, and nobody really knows why. Um, so creativity and ingenuity and innovation certainly also happens in criminal enterprise. Um, I guess one question would be, when does it happen to the great development and when does it happen to create entrenchment and rent seeking? Uh, I think a second question would be, I'm sorry, it's not good. A second question that I'd be interested in is, what type of dynamics do you think would is a player in China in terms of kind of keeping competition between civil so between civil society actors or cities and regions within China? Because it seems that one of the dynamics might be that that if one region rise, then the Chinese monopolized state would distribute power and investments to other regions and in that way kind of keep things going. So I guess those were the two questions. Um, well, I'm here under false pretenses. I just heard from a friend last night that uh, Dr. Ewan was speaking here and I wanted to come and hear her. So I don't have an invitation, so I have been guilty of adaptive something or other to get here. <laughs> uh, my name is Mark Pyman. I'm the chairman of the Afghanistan Anti-Corruption Committee. Um, and um, I, I really enjoyed your book. I mean, I really think it's a tremendous book. Um, the question I'd like to ask here is, you, you said just now, um, what we want to learn is how did China learn to create these sorts of institutions? And apart from reading your book to know the answer, my question to you is the other way around, which is, did it learn, or is actually this is just a natural way in, in which institutions can develop because we've built this huge orthodoxy that they develop some other way. So is the kind of adaptation that you described, the sort of complex processes, is that actually the natural way that things work? So they haven't actually learned anything. That's just a, an unusual, a new, and real description of how change actually happens. Um, one, one more question. Hi, uh, my name is Hadra Saeed. I am uh, not a social scientist, don't really have a public policy background. Um, I'm a physician, um, an eye surgeon at Mass General, uh, and happen to have an interest in this sort of discourse. Um, and this might be a naive question, but I'm wondering uh, how do you or can you harness without embracing? Uh, maybe they're synonymous. And if they are, then I guess we're actively making that choice of embracing and hoping that it eventually leads to um, good governance. But are they synonymous? Uh, any more? Thank you for that uh, amazing question. Uh, any more questions to the audience? Uh, well, uh, I'm just curious. Sorry, I'm just curious why uh, you chose poverty as a measure, you know, uh, rather than a broader measure which included inequality and uh, 
to environmental can you just uh, say who you are for the record? So, Sarah Latif, I, I used to work for the World Bank for my city. And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, those, uh, in 2016, a really outstanding review of the evolution of the World Bank's thinking on governance over the last 25 years, which is really well, well worth it. So, thank you for your, thank you for your work on that. Uh, any, any more questions from the audience before we move? Yeah. I'll, I'll just squeeze one in um, for any of the panelists. I, I, I just, the thing that's in my mind is like what role for citizens like where is the what are the lessons for people outside of government um i was really intrigued by this notion of like the civil service as civil society and think we could talk for about that at length but just any of your quick reflections on kind of what are lessons here for citizen engagement outside of government great so uh, thank you Nada. that was that was the one thing i wanted to bring as well i thought it would, it would be amazing another time to have a discussion between you involving you and Lily Tsai and her book about democracy, about accountability without democracy, and, and to kind of get those different perspectives on, on things. Um, so I think let's we'll leave the last word to you when. So I just want to uh, give um, Edward and Shanti uh, an opportunity to respond to uh, anything people have been uh, from other discussion comments or from some of the comments from the floor. I, I really love the question about uh, uh, whether you can uh, harness without embracing. I think that's a very um, so any any final thoughts? I'll take uh, I'll take the one on the road to Denmark. <laughs> so uh, uh, indeed, you can have institutions that satisfy these criteria. Uh, the one um, Yun was talking about, and the and also these key functions of institutions uh, that we talk about in the WDR cooperation, commitment, coordination, and they can have lead to very bad um, outcomes. And that's because, you know, we're not making a judgment on the quality of, of institutions themselves. In that case, um, slavery was characterized by huge commitment of, you know, those who were implementing it. The mafia is an example, a supreme example of commitment to, you know, the uh, the boss and to, you know, coordination among people. If you read Peter Leeson's really nice book on pirates, The Invisible Hook, I strongly recommend it. Um, uh, it examines mechanism of cooperation and and uh, defection and how pirate bosses used to maintain uh, commitment among their troops, you know, in to engage in ever repeating um, 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 piracy enterprises and solve the free rider problem, which is that once a pirate had his share, he would basically had an incentive to go and start his own, you know, pirate team. And uh, same uh, Ben Kadesh's work on the gangs in Chicago and how they enforce discipline among themselves and uh, prison gangs in uh, in uh, in California. So Gambetta's work on the mafia in Sicily. Actually, the nicest example of functions mattering more than form come from enterprises that get together to do really bad things, not good governance. So, however, what you see is whatever objective that you want to achieve, growth, security, equity, piracy, uh, etc., it to be successful in that, and regardless of the normative you know, uh, aspect of the objective, it's the function of it that is, trumps the form. These institutions that we see today in the West, democracy, etc., they arose and they acquired these particular forms because there was a reason for them to acquire that form, over, unfolding over thousands of, or hundreds of years. And the ones that arose differently in other parts of the world, and took really different forms also are fulfilling particular functions. So it's just about being mindful of copying that trapping this whole isomorphic mimicry argument. It's a cute phrase, but it doesn't really go into the, 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 the deep reasons of why these exist, and neither have I today. That's another subject. But just being mindful of not copying the way things look like, but asking the question of why is it they look like this, and what function does it do they do they do they uh, uh, matters? Um, gosh, I, I feel like 
even though we're going long, they're such good and really hard questions. And especially, you know, the idea of can you, you know, harness without embracing, I think is the crux of it really, you know. Um, I would point out, like, it's, it's so useful to study the historical examples. But the fact is, we are not, we are at a different place now. We are not going back to a time when women didn't have the vote or when ethnic minorities did not were not able to participate in society or when it was acceptable that the rich were um, in a, you know, much more privileged and you know, enjoyed privileges that everybody else couldn't. I mean, there are certain norms now that have evolved precisely because people were unhappy with that state of affairs. And so there's, I feel like we should divide between learning in a historical sense how things evolved and then transforming that into some sort of prescriptive, like what to do. Um, that's where I think development is always in a bit of a jam, right? Because that's the impulse. It's like, what do we learn and create well and I'll supply it. Um, and, and so I think we have to be careful about that, about sort of making these assumptions and to realize that these things evolved for a reason. We evolved these norms and a normative approach for a particular reason, because society has now evolved in that direction. I don't know where that takes us with respect to understanding and having a more prescriptive approach, but I think we have to respect that. Um, and, and at least incorporate that. Very much. Oh, wow, thank you very much for these excellent questions and, and also the, to the both of you, I really appreciate your comments. I'm sorry I only have limited time left and so very short answers. Uh, some questions about corruption, uh, really great questions about corruption. Um, my response to the corruption question is that it is not true that in order to have development, we must eradicate corruption. In order to have development, we need to channel corruption from bad corruption to good corruption. So I'm sorry that's not a politically correct answer, but that's true. Because if you, if you look even at advanced capitalist democracies, we do have corruption, but we have type of corruption that's very elite, Right, very sophisticated, very legalized, and it does not affect our daily lives. Right, so that's the story of capitalism. So what the trick in China is that they harness corruption, but it's not that they embraced it. The structure of corruption in China evolved over time. So that's the story that is waiting to be told in my second book. Um, but the basic way that they did it is through carrots and sticks. So had they, they had the incentives part. So I have a database that shows that the, um, the personal material benefits that go to civil servants in China, the long-term gains that they get from promoting the economy exceed the short-term gains that they can get from extraction. Right? So it actually pays for them to have a long-time horizon. And then they have the carrots. They, they penalize and they fight very hard on harmful forms of corruption, like embezzlement, petty bribery. But the type of corruption that China can't control is grand exchange-based corruption, because the guardians can guard themselves, right? It's very endemic to the authoritarian system, going back to your point. So, so that's kind of the corruption story. And then, um, Mark, thank you so much for coming. Mark wrote a wonderful blog that, that I highly encourage you to read, and that's how I knew about his work. It's called The Unhelpful Nature of Corruption. And when I read it, I was like, yes, you know, finally someone wrote it. And his basic point is that a lot of our um, research on corruption is about telling more stories of corruption and failure. Right? Poor countries are corrupt, you know, it's a terrible situation, but then there's really just sort of no way out. Right? So I really appreciated his blog. But his question is about learning. So I'm going to address that. Um, the point about, is, is, you know, is it, I think your question was, you know, if, if China just let things be, would it have learned anyway? Would it have evolved anyway? And that goes to the sort of second part of my book about directed improvisation, which is that in order to learn and adapt effectively, you do need to have structure. You do need to actually design the right institutions. So it's not like, oh, okay, you know, anything goes free for all and you learn and you adapt. So if you go online and you Google the word directed improvisation, you'll find it, it appears in three settings. First is my book. And the second is it appears in performing arts. Right? Because if you actually know artists and directors, it's not true that because they're artists, they're very freewheeling. You know, they do whatever they like. No, you know, artists are really strict people. 
<laughs> yeah, they're very disciplined. And that's why creative improvisation actually appears in performing arts. The idea is that in order to be creative, you need to be very structured. You need to create the right environment, the right incentives, the right rules. And the third setting in which you find the term directed improvisation is machine learning. And this is another area of my research. Because in order for you to teach the machine how to learn, you also have to give the machine rules. Right? So this is actually at the crux of what it takes to learn effectively. It has to be a combination of freedom, but also with structure and with rules. And what we can learn from China is how they combine these two things. And then the final part is a really fascinating one. It's actually something just came up as I was talking, uh, which is that we often think that you know, promoting transparency, open governance should be targeted at civil society. Our understanding of civil society is citizens. But I was thinking, in my understanding of China, oftentimes the civil servants are the civil society. They are the ones doing the innovation, the participation, the inclusiveness, the debate. So I think it may be very important to actually bring them into our understanding of civil society and encourage transparency, participation, participation and innovation within the government. So on that note, thank you very, very much for this wonderful conversation. I learned tremendously and thank you, Alan. And just to, just to finish, thank you so much to the audience for coming along and for the uh, really excellent range of questions and comments. Uh, thank you to, to the panelists. Thank you, Edouard. Uh, and we appreciate your unconventionality underneath your suit. Uh, thank you, Shanti, for stepping in uh, at the last minute and for sharing your, your reflections from a kind of uh, democracy and rights perspective value, you know, uh, placing that high on the agenda. Uh, and thank you, uh, Yuen, for uh, an amazing book. Uh, I've read the whole thing. That doesn't happen very often with, with 350 page books. So I read the whole thing. I thoroughly recommend it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, I, have a, I have a spare copy. Maybe I should uh, do a lottery for the spare copy. Uh, thank you all for coming. We look forward to welcoming you in again, maybe uh, to talk about varieties of corruption uh, and good and bad corruption uh, and seeing uh, and seeing how that, that uh, discussion goes. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, there's lots of food uh, and some drink to be had, so do help yourself on the way out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.